Welcome to the Absite Smackdown Podcast. We'll talk clinical scenarios, interesting Absite facts, and interesting general surgery knowledge. Now, let's get to it. Hi, and welcome back to the Absite Smackdown Review. This talk is all about the small bowel, and there are a lot of facts that come up on the Absite about the small bowel. <clears throat> First, let's talk about the, uh, the uh, embryology of the small bowel. And the gut appears during gestation at week four. We see it here, and this ring around the gut is to sort of tell us the gut's position relative to the abdomen at these times. It's actually really interesting because the gut herniates out of the abdomen at week six. It's outside, and it actually twists and folds on itself. This portion eventually becomes the cecum and ends up in its position, except when it doesn't when it returns to the abdomen, sometimes after a non-rotation or a partial rotation or a bad or mal-rotation. So this is the umbilicus, that kind of green area is the uh, area that will be the umbilicus. This is the uh, SMA axis here. So really interesting. We'll talk a lot more about it during the pediatrics lecture. But for now, know that the duodenum comes from the junction of the foregut and the midgut, and it appears with recanalization, the area opens up. The jejunum and proximal portion of the ilium from the proximal limb of the midgut loop, well, that's where they derive from, this proximal limb of the midgut loop. So jejunum and a part of the ilium. And you can see that as it kind of goes through here and ends up here. The distal ilium comes from the caudal limb of the midgut loop, distal ilium. And at week 11, the midgut loop rotates 270 degrees, week 11, counterclockwise around the superior mesenteric artery. So there's the superior mesenteric artery. And at week 11, you get this counterclockwise rotation if all goes well. And if all goes well, it's complete. And uh, you end up with a position that is so familiar to us for where everything sits um, in the final um, uh, version. But not always. And again, the pediatrics, uh, pediatrics talk, we'll talk more about it. Remember that the submucosa includes blood vessels, lymphatics, and the myenteric Meissner's plexus. Meissner's submucosal plexus, it's in the submucosa. We'll talk a little bit more about this submucosa in just a little bit. The mucosa includes epithelium, muscularis mucosa, and lamina propria, the connective tissue. That's kind of everything that's in what we typically call the mucosa. Epithelium, muscularis mucosa, and this lamina propria connective tissue. Here's a fast fact from at daily.absite.fact on Instagram. Lymph aggregates called Peyer's patches are most prevalent in the ilium. So there's a lot of lymphatic action there. Here's one of those aggregates now, one of those Peyer's patches prevalent in the ilium. And remember that Bruner's glands at the duodenum produce this alkaline secretion that protects against acidic gastric chyme. Interestingly, there's an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of um, mus muscularis, and that's in the propria. Here it is, circular muscle, longitudinal muscle. There's our box, myenteric plexus, myenteric muscle in the gut, uh, between them. So kind of an interesting position for where our box is compared to Meisner's. Meisner's is aka the submucosal plexus. It's in the submucosa. And our box is the myenteric plexus between these layers of muscle. Classically, the duodenum is thought to be the first 20 centimeters of the small bowel. But we don't really take a tape measure out and measure, you know, is this the duodenum? And well, we're only at 19 centimeters. Could this be duodenum? And well, it's kind of contracting. Well, of course, we don't do it that way. We look for the ligament of trites. After the LOT, the duodenum becomes the jejunum. There's no particular anatomic boundary. It's kind of interesting. Jejunum, jejun, is an English word that just means devoid of nutrition. But the jejunum is where there's a lot of action that happens to absorb different things. But we'll talk in just a second about the fact that the duodenum absorbs a lot. And so by the time things get to this portion of the small bowel, after the ligament of trites, they're kind of jejun. There's a lot less 
stuff in them, uh, the duodenum's absorbed a bunch, and we'll talk about that in a second. The serosa is a single layer of mesoepithelial cells, and those line the entire interior of the small intestine. So there's this serosa lining the interior. When you go to stitch on small intestine uh, by hand, uh, there's a classic teaching that the tip of the needle, the area over the tip of the needle as you bring the needle through the bowel, needs to turn white. And that's because the strength layer of bowel is submucosa. So the strength from anastomosis initially comes from submucosa and that needle turning white as it passes through that area. Uh, the Not the needle itself, but as the needle comes up through the bowel, you'll see it, there'll be a white area there. That means you got the submucosa. A classic teaching in the OR, that the submucosa is the strength layer. Hey guys, it's me, your host, Jessica, for Absite Smackdown Podcast. Do you want more content? Then go to our website, www appsitesmackdown.com for links to all of our social media, our blogs, and our podcast. Let's talk a little bit about the differences between the jejunum and the ileum. It comes up a lot. There's really no anatomic boundary, but the jejunum is different from the ileum, and you can tell them apart by the greater circumference of the jejunum, the longer vasa recta with fewer arcades, and the plique circulares that are both greater in number and longer in the jejunum. So the jejunum has this longer uh, vasa recta. It's got uh, these fewer arcades compared to the ilium. Um, the plique circulares uh, are both greater in number and longer in the jejunum. So important differences. In about the five to six meters of small intestine subsequent to the duodenum, Approximately the proximal 40% is jejunum and distal 60% is ileum. Just kind of a rule of thumb. It's hard to tell the difference though. And these are just some of the ways you can tell that difference. There's an interesting mnemonic for remembering certain key metabolite absorption sites. And that's dude is just feeling ill, bro. The duodenum absorbs iron, a lot of it. Uh, jejunum gets folate, ileum gets B12. Enterocytes, like screen right, specialize in the absorption of dietary nutrients and uh, digestion. Greater than 90% of the epithelial cells in the small bowel are enterocytes, and they come up within the crypts of Lieberkuhn. They migrate to the villi tips over time. Then there's another cell type, that's the panath cell. It's found at the base of the crypts of Lieberkuhn, and now that does a lot of stuff. It defends mucosa, it, uh, it demonstrates phagocytosis, it regulates flora in the intestine, and there's a secretion of peptides with certain antimicrobial properties. There are also M cells. These are microfold cells. Their function is antigen presentation, and they're located just above Peyer's patches. There are goblet cells. Those secrete mucus, and there are enteroendocrine cells, which produce and secrete a lot of different hormones, like secretin, or secretin, some say, uh, that comes from S cells. There's motilin. There's somatostatin from D cells. There's cholecystokinin from I cells. There's peptide YY that these enteroendocrine cells make. There are apod cells, immune precursor uptake and decarboxylase. Uh, they have 5-hydroxytryptamine um, release. There's it's a carcinoid precursor, these apod cells. There's glucagon-like peptoid 2, and there's gastric inhibitory peptide. In short, a lot of cells in the gut do a lot of things hormonally, and apid cells are probably worth knowing about owing to the association with carcinoid. Speaking of carcinoid, uh, carcinoid can cause pellagra, and those are the four Ds classically, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. And carcinoid can do that because tryptophan is diverted to serotonin, diverted to, or which goes to make 5-HIAA. So this tryptophan diversion, because of a large carcinoid or a carcinoid that is diverting it from its typical pathway, that can cause pellagra. Uh, there's also a niacin diverted as part of this pathway. So because niacin is diverted along with the tryptophan in this uh, pathway from its typical uh, role, that's how you end up with pellagra from tryptophan diversion. The most common sites for carcinoid in order of frequency from lowest to highest spell air, appendix, it's 50%, ileum, and rectum. Remember, if there's a carcinoid involving the appendix, uh, if it's in the base at all, if it involves the base, the uh, right hemicolectomy is required. Um, if it's not in the base, that's when we start to talk about size criteria. Uh, 
a size criterion here is if it's less than two centimeters, you can perform an appendectomy only. Now, unfortunately, sometimes when you perform an appendectomy, you either didn't suspect, didn't have reason to suspect, um, that there would be a lesion there that would turn out to be carcinoid. So you get it back on pathology. And again, that's why it's important that if the base of the appendix is involved with some lesion or there's a question, uh, you, you really have to be careful with how you proceed from there. And there are several options. You can wait on path. You can uh, do many different things. But the headline here is for carcinoid, and you often don't know it's carcinoid while you're in the OR, um, you need to go ahead and uh, do that right hemicolectomy and assess the lymph nodes. So typically we say take the um, 13 or so lymph nodes to assess for lymphatic spread. Of course, you inspect the liver uh, to help determine if there are any um, metastases to the liver. That can be really tough when you're doing an appendectomy. You don't expect this. It's the middle of the night, um, but that's sort of the standard for carcinoid. Next up is serotonin. That's secreted by Kolchinsky cells, these enterochromaffin cells. These cells stain positive with argentafin. And again, uh, serotonin is part of this pathway involved with carcinoid. Only approximately 9% of patients who do have metastatic disease get carcinoid syndrome. So the classic teaching for medical school is if you have metastases, if you have carcinoid syndrome, flushing, asthma, diarrhea, right-sided valve lesions, um, right-sided heart lesions, you say, oh, they, they have carcinoid syndrome, but it turn, uh, they have to have metastases to the liver because the liver will um, scavenge carcinoid uh, via the, uh, the products of the carcinoid tumor and you won't get any of these systemic findings. So the, if they have these systemic findings, they have to have METs to the liver. Well, that's true. But what's interesting is even if you have METs to the liver, only about 9% of patients who have metastatic disease will have carcinoid syndrome. It's kind of interesting when you learn it because you realize, wow, most patients, even those with metastatic carcinoid, don't have carcinoid syndrome. Also, one-third of patients who have small bowel carcinoid have multiple sites, and I've seen that the few times I've seen a small bowel carcinoid, a uh, lesion that we removed um, for whatever reason. We look around and we say, oh, well, there's another one. So there are multiple primary sites about a third of the time, and about one-quarter have a metachronous adenocarcinoma. So just be meticulous about it when you look at the bowel and other sites uh, during these procedures. If you find one strange thing and you think it may be a carcinoid, uh, look for other things because they're going to be around, especially uh, remember that a quarter have a metachronous adenocarcinoma. The chemo regimen for carcinoid is strepto, uh, uh, streptozosin, uh, doxorubicin, and 5-FU. Uh, those are the palliative ones. The Absite Smackdown Podcast. Visit the Smackdown at AbsiteSmackdown.com. <clears throat> One of the other things that comes up frequently on the Absite is the sequelae of terminal ileal resection. And there are many here that are important. The terminal ileum, when resected, means that you're going to have decreased bile salt resorption and you're going to have less colonic water absorption, and you're going to have diarrhea. So diarrhea is one important sequelum that happens when you take out the terminal ileum. This ultimately results in a decreased B12 and intrinsic factor absorption. Uh, so you have decreased binding of oxalate, and you get more oxalate absorbed in the colon. So the bottom line is terminal ileum resection can give you oxalate stones more commonly, kidney stones. Bowel rest with, uh, well, let's focus on that before we get to the sort of fast absite facts that we have coming up. That's just one of the sequelae of terminal ileal resection. We'll get to another one. But uh, here, it's just important to know that um, this is uh, one of the sequelae when you think about the small bowel and terminal ileal resection. Sometimes it has to come out, but when it does, when you do resect that area, uh, just keep in mind things happen after. Let's move on to some fast absite facts related to the small bowel. Some of these are kind of interesting to me. They're classic review book facts, but um, see what you think. See if you feel like I do that there's probably more to some of these. There's more to a lot of these absite facts. 
Here's one now. Bowel rest with a nasogastric tube cures 65% of partial small bowel obstructions and 20% of complete small bowel obstructions. If you think about that for a second, that fact always struck me as strange. Uh, it sort of seems like you're saying an NG tube can, can uh, resolve a complete small bowel obstruction 20% of the time. I think if you look at the definition of partial versus complete small bowel obstruction, um, that's kind of just an interesting finding. It's not a thing I typically think of it as. I feel like if you have a complete bowel obstruction, uh, you will fail an NG tube and you won't get better. And if you did get better with it, well, then it was partial. You weren't completely blocked off. It just seems strange to me. I, I can't imagine a scenario where a small bowel obstruction, like a volvulus, complete bowel obstruction, uh, or something similar is somehow relieved by an NG tube. So this is a classic review book stat. I find it strange. Um, it's just kind of out there. Classic absite fact from the books, but I think um, in real life, uh, it would be sort of strange to say, well, we're going to leave an NG tube in this person. Let's say they are um, uh, someone who, for some reason, cannot tolerate a surgical procedure. And we think they probably have a small bowel obstruction. We're going to place an NG tube and expect a 20% resolution rate. It just seems strange to me. But it's a classic fact. So there it is. Here's another fast fact from daily.absite.fact and that is uh, fistula and the things that prevent fistula from healing. So for a little bit, we're going to talk about fistula. You've probably heard of the mnemonic friends. Decreased healing rate is seen in the presence of friends. So these are things that make fistula not heal. Foreign body, like a suture or something in the area. Radiation, because of what it does in part to the uh, small vessels in the area that would allow healing. Radiation helps obliterate them so things don't heal. Inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, UC, et cetera. Epithelialization, so a long-standing tract that's epithelialized. A neoplasm, uh, like a tumor in the area that is a problem. A distal obstruction, so the fistula's blocked distally. And sepsis or infection. So those are friends that prevent fistula from healing. Um, at the review level, uh, review book level, TPN is proven to increase closure rate of fistulas, but not really shown to increase survival rate. Now, patients with Crohn's disease with numerous strictures. In general, the strategy is to avoid resection and short gut. You perform strictureoplasties. Um, if there are several that are really close together, that can be a little bit more challenging, but the headline is, in general, the operative strategy is don't resect uh, strictures in Crohn's disease, owing to things like leak rate, non-healing, et cetera. Perform strictureoplasties when you can, when they're a good candidate for it. Next, let's talk about bowel obstruction due to gallstones. And this is typically, if they have a bowel obstruction due, uh, due to gallstones, like a gets called a gallstone ileus, remember they have to have a cholecystoenteric fistula. It has to be a connection. These stones do not go uh, through the bile duct and through the sphincter of Odi. Uh, it's usually a fistula of the second portion of the duodenum. And the classic teaching is remove the stone to relieve the small bowel obstruction, but leave the gallbladder and fistula intact at the initial procedure. People go back and forth about this all the time. Uh, but this is the classic answer. And remember, small bowel uh, obstruction with air in the biliary tree is often what's seen. So air in the biliary tree here on x-ray. Let's talk a little bit more about these metabolic absorption sites. Um, dude is just feeling ill, bro. Duodenum does iron, jejunum does folate, and the ileum does B12. Maximum absorption occurs in the jejunum, which is really interesting. The jejunum, jejun means not a lot of nutrition. Yet maximum absorption occurs in the, je the jejunum except for bile acids, which occurs mostly in the ileum. Iron, which happens in the duodenum. Folate, which happens mostly in the jejunum, not the terminal ileum, and bile acids and B12 with intrinsic factor in the ileum. Let's move on to arterial supply to the small bowel. And that comes mostly from the SMA, where it enters on the mesenteric side of the jejunum and ileum. The mesentery carries these vessels. So the antimesenteric side is the initial area 
to become ischemic when blood supply is decreased or there's poor oxygen delivery, embolus, sepsis, etc. Here's small bowel. This often gets called, this small bowel clearly looks threatened if not dead, especially all along here. But sometimes on patients on high dose pressors, you'll see these black stripes all along the bowel. It's called tiger striping. This one looks a lot more threatened and purple than just tiger striping. But you end up with a classic question, what do we do with tiger striping? And you'd have to resect the whole bowel. There's stripes very often. In those cases, you do not resect the bowel. You resuscitate, you try to get the pressors off. This bowel in this picture looks a little more threatened than tiger striping. So this would be a tough call. You have to probably, it, without seeing the whole length of the bowel, probably this bowel is dead or very threatened. Um, it would be important to understand the context. Is this through a hernia? What's going on here? Is this the full length of the small bowel? Can't really tell for sure. But the bottom line is it's not always as straightforward as you think. Sometimes you say, oh yeah, that bowel's clearly dead. We're taking it out. Back to viable bowel for uh, either an anastomosis or it may leave them in discontinuity depending on how sick they are. Lots of options. But the headline is for this point, and the reason we show this here is the antimesenteric side is the first side to show problems with um, the first side to show problems with uh, vascular issues. We can talk all day about whether this should be resected or not. Odds are this bowel should be resected. Interestingly, 90% of water is absorbed in the jejunum. Like we said, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the jejunum, even though jejun means not a lot of nutrition. It turns out, Again, 90% of water that your body absorbs is not done in the colon. It's done in the jejunum. But the colon's primary absorptive function is to absorb water. So it's kind of like almost being very deliberate about how we talk about where and how water is absorbed. Sure, the colon's primary job is to do that, but the jejunum has it all over it. The jejunum has 90% of the absorption. So it's got it all over the colon when it comes to water absorption. Next up for blood supply, the celiac axis supplies foregut and portion of the duodenum. And remember the SMA supplies a portion of the duodenum and the SMA is the blood supply to the jejunum. So interestingly, this comes up a lot. Here's the, once again, that uh, celiac trunk, splenic, left gastric, common hepatic, GDA is given off, proper hepatic. We talked all about the variants here, but there is a anterior and posterior superior pancreatic or duodenal. Those come off of here. They're celiac artery derived, ultimately celiac axis derived. From the bottom, the SMA comes up with the inferior pancreatic or duodenals, and it gets the rest of this area. And there's a collateral between these and the um, inferior pancreatic or duodenal. So the SMA supplies a portion of the duodenum and it's the blood supply to the jejunum. Here we focused on the celiac just to remind you of all the things it does. But remember, superior, uh, the anterior and posterior, superior pancreatic or duodenal arteries and estimos with the anterior and posterior inferior pancreatic or duodenal arteries from the SMA. Next, let's talk about causes of bowel obstruction with and without history of previous surgery. Interestingly, if there is a history of previous surgery, the, and this is what we see all the time, this is what we think about all the time because we run into it, it's probably adhesions if it's a small bowel obstruction. But if it's a large bowel obstruction, it's probably cancer. Whether they had surgery, if they had surgery, okay? probably, still probably cancer if it's large bowel. Large bowel obstructions are not the same as small bowel obstructions that we see all the time. So if someone comes in with a large bowel obstruction, don't make the mistake of saying to yourself, oh, <clears throat> it's just a, probably adhesions again. Nope, large bowel obstructions are different. Now, if a patient comes in with a bowel obstruction without a history of previous surgery, if it's small bowel, it's probably a hernia somewhere. So if the ER calls and they say they have a patient with no previous surgery who has a bowel obstruction, be on the, and it's a small bowel obstruction, just be on the lookout for a hernia that somebody didn't notice yet. But if uh, there is no history of surgery, same scenario, and it's a large bowel obstruction, cancer again. So bottom line here is, the lesson is large bowel obstruction, 
with or without history of previous surgery, if it's a large bowel obstruction, be on the lookout for cancer. Well, remember how we said there's so much action in the jejunum, and there are key macronutrients absorbed there too. Um, it absorbs carbs, proteins via active transport, and fat via passive transport. It also absorbs fructose and galactose. Fructose is a facilitated diffusion. Galactose and glucose are active, actively absorbed. Just a kind of a cleanup fact that comes up. And remember, the jejunum's absorptive capacity is really key. It, even though it's called the jejunum and there's not a lot of nutrition, it does a lot. Remember, all that water it absorbs. Uh, the colon is not absorbing 90% of all the water the jejunum is. Next up, let's talk about some most common tumors. For example, the most common tumor to metastasize to the small bowel is melanoma. So this is going to the small bowel. And uh, that comes up a lot. It's featured on daily.absite.fact a lot because it's just interesting that melanoma is the most common tumor to metastasize to the small bowel. It's one of the many places it goes. There are some other absite touch-ups and physiologic facts that come up all the time, and we're, we're at another one. This one is blind loop syndrome. Uh, blind loop syndrome is where you have a loop of bowel and it's just not connected to anything. It doesn't drain anything. This can be a blind loop of bowel created intentionally as part of a reconstruction for a Bill Roth II or something similar. You can have bacterial overgrowth in it because stuff isn't really clear. There's not food passing by and you can get B12 consumption from that. So patients can become B12 deficient, almost like they lost intrinsic factor or lost their terminal ileum. So the treatment here is B12 and tetracycline or augmentin. That'll decrease the bacterial burden in it and you'll be able to absorb uh, more B12. Next up is the GIS tumor. This comes up all the time. The gastrointestinal stroma tumor is a mutation in the CKIT gene that produces, CKIT produces tyrosine kinase. It's a mesenchymal tumor and the typical presentation is a GI bleed. Uh, upper GI bleed is pretty comp, is seen um, in these patients and then that keys you in, you start looking and go, up. Oh, it's a GIST tumor. The treatment is with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, imatinib mesylate, which I never say, we just say Gleevec, and resection with negative margins by frozen section is key. So this GIST tumor comes up a lot. Another clinical scenario that comes up a lot is appendicitis with suspected Crohn's. This is a tough one. Uh, first, if you see Crohn's elsewhere in the bowel, leave it alone. Whether that's through the laparoscope, open, whatever you're doing, if you see Crohn's elsewhere, leave it alone. That's not the problem. It's not why you're there. Uh, resecting it just brings you a leak rate. There are all kinds of arguments to just avoid doing that. If the appendix is not involved, take it out because that way you know it's not the appendix next time the Crohn's patient comes in with abdominal pain. So if it's not involved, appendix comes out. If it is involved, it's kind of backward, don't take it out owing to the chance of a complication. People argue about this all the time. Does it matter whether the base is involved or the tip or what? We can talk about it all day, but the classic teaching is if the appendix is involved with the Crohn's, uh, don't take it out the appendix is um, involved, especially if you see it anywhere near the base, that's where you'll get your leak rate and the fistula rate from, et cetera. Let's go back to the terminal ileum now, because this comes up a lot. Terminal ileal disease in Crohn's leads to this inability to resorb bile. Same thing we saw before uh, when we talked about terminal ileal issues. So you can't resorb bile into the enterohepatic circulation. And so free cholesterol is abundant because there's no bile to keep it soluble. And it turns into stones in the gallbladder of Crohn's patients. So terminal allele disease in Crohn's patients leads to ultimately gallstones. Next up, let's bounce back to enterocytes. Uh, one of the classic facts that come up is that glutamine is the fuel of enterocytes. Glutamine is a conditionally essential amino acid. When you're stressed, you don't make it so well. And enterocytes require it. So sometimes, even if you can't quite feed a patient, sometimes people will just give them glutamine to keep their brush border intact and um, allow the enterocytes to eat. A normal enterocyte lives for a little more than two days. 
and columnar uh, cells are the principal cells of the villus. These enterocytes are found in the mucosa of the small and large bowel, of course, and they absorb a variety of nutrients like we've been talking about all the time. Really fascinating uh, because glutamine is their preferred fuel, that conditional essential amino acid, and there's a lot of turnover here. There's, these cells are turning over every two days or so. Another fast fact is that 80% of ingested vitamin K is absorbed from the small bowel directly into the intestinal lymph. That's how it gets around. Well, we've talked a lot already about blood supply to the duodenum, and here it is again. Main blood supply to the duodenum is from the superior and inferior pancreatic or duodenal arteries. Superior coming off here, inferior coming from the SMA down here. They have uh, they sort of connect around the head of the pancreas and the duodenum in this area. It's a collateral circulatory route. Branches of the gastroduodenal and SMA, respectively, um, supply uh, superior and inferior. Proximal half of the duodenum is supplied by the superior pancreatic duodenal artery and the distal half by the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. Proximal duodenum, superior pancreatic duodenal artery. These anastomose to form anterior and posterior arterial arcades between the duodenum and the pancreas. The superior part of the duodenum up here can also be supplied by a superduodenal artery coming from the common hepatic or the GDA. It can come from the right gastric artery, get some flow from there, the right gastroepiploic and the GDA. Uh, these vessels often uh, anastomose with each other. But the key here is that anatomic relationship with the anterior superior and posterior superior and the anterior inferior and posterior inferior pancreatic or duodenal arteries. The Absite Smackdown podcast is based on the best-selling review book, Absite Smackdown, the only Absite review with an entire video review course included. Visit AbsiteSmackdown.com and pick it up today. Let's talk about the MMC the migratory motor complex. It's another thing that comes up all the time, and it's seen during fasting. With phase one, not much happens. There's not much contractile activity. Here's phase one, not much happening. Phase two, intermittent spike activity with smooth muscle, muscle contraction. Phase three, spike activity. It's regular, strong contractile activity is seen, and this is where motilin from the M cell acts, phase three. Phase four, kind of a brief spike activity. It's really short. It's a transition between regular contractile activity and the quiescent phase. The whole thing takes about 90 minutes to 120 minutes, so just about two hours. Each phase starts in the distal esophagus and stomach, and it goes to the duodenum and migrates down the intestine. It takes, like we said, about two hours, about 120 minutes. Complexes are present only in the fasted state. They don't seem to have anything to do with mixing or propulsion of ingested meals. We think it may be to clear old debris from the system, but it doesn't seem to be related to meals or what we need to do for meals. It's something in between. So it kind of makes sense if you think that's its point that it is not related to meals. It just clears out debris and similar things. Oh, there it is on the slide. The function can be to clear the small bowel of residual food, secretions, desquamated cells, and its inner digestive time. The MMC can serve to limit overgrowth of bacteria, and phase three includes secretion of pepsin, secretion of hydrochloric acid, secretion of amylase and bicarbonate by the pancreas. So phase three is where all the action is. It's where modulin affects things. It's where things get secreted. Phase three. Increasing duodenal output of bile acid during phase two, that's seen, it's sort of the exception of this, bile acid comes out more, uh, but it's sort of everything gets flushed out. And phase three is where a lot of the action is to increase secretion of different things. Now, that's the MMC. But now let's talk about screen left, which has a really clear photo of intussusception. So let's change modes from MMC to now into susception as a pathologic state in the small bowel. This part is called the intussuscipians, and let me help you remember that. The intussuscipians is the recipient of the other part. Intussuscipians is the recipient of the other part. The other part is the intussusceptum. 
The intussusceptum of an adult often contains a malignant lead point. It got this way for a reason in an adult. Oh, and here's the what we just said. Intussuscipiens is the part of the balance of the recipient of the other piece. The other part's the intussusceptum. The whole thing is called an intussusception. And remember, in adults, when you see this, there's often a malignant lead point that caused this to happen. That's the small bowel talk. There's so much in there that is often uh, comes up on the app site, particularly appendicitis and Crohn's, things that happen with terminal ileum resection as a sequelae, as a sequelum. There's just a lot for this section. Part of the reason we share things the way we do for Absite Smackdown is to help you review all these different facts over time. So if you haven't already, take a look at the Insta at daily.absite.fact because even if you're looking at this close to the Absite for this year, for future years, this is going to help you. It just gives you a fact a day. It's not always question or quiz. It's just a way to look at a fact with a relevant picture or cartoon or something to help you over time uh, to have these facts in front of you. There's um, That's available for you on the daily.absite.fact. On Facebook, you can do the same thing. So while you're going through your social media or saying hi to friends or interacting with people, we have all these facts out there for you. And most of what the team does for the uh, Project SmackDown team, you can follow hashtag Project SmackDown team or hashtag Absite SmackDown. Most of what we do is no charge. And we do that to help get the content out there. We want to keep it that way. So drop a positive review for us on Amazon. Uh, we have gotten fake reviews. Those can make it tough. Uh, sometimes those are from uh, competing books. Um, and we know they're not real. Uh, because often they're from people who've never signed up for the course, never seen it, uh, but they're commenting on it. And um, there's lots of ways we can tell. So any uh, positive review, we welcome it. We also welcome your feedback. Please give us any feedback for things we can improve on directly at info at thehealthcarelab.org. You can find these facts uh, we have out there. We also have um, free facts and free lectures for your colleagues all throughout the web. Um, you can just look at any of the social profiles and you can be directed there uh, from just clicking on the links and exploring. So go ahead and explore Twitter at Absite Smackdown, LinkedIn at Absite Smackdown, YouTube, the Absite Smackdown channel, and that's where the video podcast is, host, uh, is hosted, and also the Absite Smackdown podcast, uh, which we hope you're finding enjoyable. Uh, we have several hundred listeners a day. We really appreciate it. Uh, we share all kinds of things beyond Absite Smackdown that are related to the Absite. And you can find that all over iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, um, Amazon, just all over. So, with that, uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, remember to check out the small bowel, go through it in the book. There are certain key things like carcinoid and pellagra. Um, carcinoid syndrome, and even when you have METs to deliver, you typically don't have that. Just so many classic absite facts that come from the small bowel talk. Hope you find it really useful, and we'll see you soon for the next one. Thanks for listening to the Absite Smackdown podcast. Visit us at absitesmackdown.com for more great absite facts.